For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black. Astonishment had taken hold on me. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? Why then is not the health of the daughter of my people recovered? Let's pray. Father, we sure do love you. We're thankful you're our shepherd tonight. Lord, we enjoyed all the good singing, and congregational singing, the special singing. Lord, we're thankful for the good testimonies. Lord, we're thankful you're a good God. Now, Father, I pray you'd help us from the scriptures now. You said, so then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Lord, I pray you'd increase our faith. Lord, as Brother Brian already said in his testimony, things aren't going to get any better in this old world. This old world's been spinning out of course for some time, and things are winding down for this dispensation of the Scriptures, the Grace Age. Lord, we know that at any time you could take your church out of here. Lord, uh, this world is set up for the Antichrist to take over. God, all the handwriting's on the wall. Lord, we see it all. We know it's going to come to pass. Lord, it's exciting times for the child of God. For Lord, we know you're coming for us. Lord, we'll be out of here soon. Lord, everything we long for and everything that we desire and all the things we uh, uh, long to see. And Lord, most importantly, to see you as you are. And God, those days are fast approaching. And God, we're excited about that. But Lord, our hearts burden for those that are not ready to come. And God, I certainly pray. Uh, Lord, uh, as Brother Brian said in his testimony, some of the word of God's fall on deaf ears. I pray that folks would start listening. And I pray folks would turn to God before it's everlasting too late. Now help us, Lord. Get glory to your name. And Father, we'll bless you for it. For it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we ask these things. Amen. And amen. Jeremiah is known as the weeping prophet. We know that the book of Jeremiah is some 50 chapters, but then Jeremiah has a, another book following it, the book of Lamentations, which is him just weeping, burden for his people. And Jeremiah's desires that God's people would get right with God and that God's people would turn from their ways back to God much like our desires uh, that we'd see America once again become a Christian nation, that we see, we'd see America uh, uh, treat people the way a people should be treated. In America, uh, uh, we would have righteousness from the uh, church house to the White House. But uh, 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 we see things going on in America today that uh, uh, cause us to be burdened, cause us to weep for families and for homes and for all that's going on in this uh, Oh, uh, sorry country we live in. Uh, and so we see that uh, Jeremiah is upset and, and he's musing here in these verses. I want you to notice, first of all, the calamity. Look again in verse number 20. He says, the harvest is past, the summer is ended, and we are not saved. And Jeremiah is saying that uh, he had been preaching and been warning. Uh, 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 summer had come and gone. Uh, uh, the harvest had come and gone, and yet the people were not saved. They had not turned from their ways back to God. What a calamity. Can I say, I've been preaching this book for nearly 47 years. Or I've been saved 47 years, been preaching this book about 35 years now. And can I say something about uh, the preaching of this book? Every time you open it, you hope you help people and you want to see people get right with the Lord. And can I say, in all the years of preaching, I've never seen enough people get right with God. Hmm. Matter of fact, it seems like we've seen more leave than you see come. And that's a sad, sad calamity. And Jeremiah, in all of his preaching, 40 years, we don't have in the records of the scriptures one convert come to God. We see the calamity. Notice how Jeremiah is cut. Look at verse 21. He says, For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. I am black. Astonishment had taken hold on me. You see, with 
Israel turning their back on God, God cut off the blessings. Now Israel is about ready to be taken hostage by uh, uh, Babylon and Israel will become slaves and Jeremiah has been warning this and instead of uh, 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 the people uh, turning to God and getting things made right, uh, 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 now they're being besieged and now the blessings have been cut off, uh, 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 the harvest isn't as good uh, and the people of God are hurting and when Jeremiah sees them hurting, he's hurting. If there's any indictment of the church today, is we are so busy living our lives, we don't take time to see the hurt in other people, and we have no burden for people. But notice what he says. He says, For the hurt of the daughter of my people am I hurt. He says, I am black. Astonishment hath taken hold on me. He's astonished to think that they won't turn to God. Listen, I'm not the brightest light bulb in a bunch. By the way, these new bright light bulbs, my wife told me I've got to start working, wearing makeup. I'm, I'm shining too much up here. I don't know about all that. The day I start working, wearing makeup, somebody pull out a 45 and put me out of my misery, all right? Brother Jim, that's your job, okay? All right? Makeup, yeah, right. Anyway, deal with the shine, folks. That's all I can tell you, huh? But, but listen, the, there's, he's astonished that his people hadn't turned to God. I look around this world. I'm astonished people don't wake up. <clears throat> Do you really think that what's happening in Washington, those running Washington, can solve the world's problems? We got somebody called a vice president don't even know you, you, you know Ukraine's not part of the UN. Of course, she don't even know that America's part of the UN. She don't even know what planet she's on. But she's brighter than the other one. <clears throat> Anybody ever see the movie The American President? Three people. That's where we got Sidney's name from. Nett and I watched that movie, and one of the lead characters' name is a lady by the name of Sidney Allen Wade. We heard that. That's the first time we ever heard Sidney for a girl, and we thought, we kind of like that. So that was in the running, and when she came out, she looked like a Sidney, so she's Sidney. But toward the end of that movie, the guy is the, that is the president, who's played by Michael Douglas, he's a widower in the office, and and he's being constantly barraged by somebody who's running against him and, and just saying all kinds of mean and terrible things about him, and, and he, he won't defend himself. He's just like, let him say what he wants to say. But his poll numbers keep dropping and keep dropping and keep dropping because people are listening to the other side, and Michael J. Fox is one of his uh, 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 chief of staff or something. Michael J. Fox tells him, he says, hey, the reason that your poll numbers are dropping is because they don't get to hear your side. And so finally he'd had enough of it, and he tells his opponent, he said, your 15 minutes are up. He said, I am the President of the United States. And he stood up and he made some, some, some you know, a stand. And I said that to say this, there is nobody standing up for America. Uh, think about it. Now, let me help you something. I, I'm not preaching a, polit a political message. I'm just on politics right now. As we sit here, as we breathe, as we live, right now, in reserve, just stored away, we have enough oil to last 200 years. Now, America's just, you know, 230, 240, 250 years old, however long I didn't do the math. So we got enough oil to last us almost as long as we've been in existence. Mm -mm. Now, you, you understand that, don't you? All they got to do is open the valve, and gas prices drop from $3.99 in Florence, Kentucky, back to $1.27 overnight. Nobody in Washington knows how to turn the valve on. 
No, it's worse than that. It's diabolical. Have you watched any commercials and seen anything about electric cars? Ford's got an electric pickup truck. Kia's got a cute little electric car now. Then we got Tesla, the king of electric cars. And you got all, everybody's got electric cars. Because now that the Democrats are back in control, everything is about the new Green Deal again. It's all about windmills, and it's all about clean energy, and it's all about all this stuff. One of the, uh, uh, the politicians came out this week and said, if you want gas prices come down, just buy electric cars. I think them Teslas started about 60 and go up to $120,000. Anybody here afford a $120,000 car? The gas prices are not going to come down because they want you to buy these electric cars. Now, here's, here's, the, here's the idiocracy of it all. It takes coal and fossil fuels to run plants that produce electricity. It's not about clean energy. Again, it's about them controlling you and manipulating you into doing what they want you to do. Just like COVID. By the way, what happened to COVID? We went from 15,000 cases a day to what COVID? I tell you what happened. The guys that can't opened the valve, flipped the switch, and now COVID's gone. They beat that narrative to death, and you wasn't listening no more, so they went away with it. Now come up with something by the end of summer to scare you so you vote Democrat again in the fall. But see, what I can't understand, you and I see this stuff. What why doesn't the American people stand up and say, enough? You do know every one of those jokers work for us. Now, we've been hoodwinked into thinking, well, we really can't do anything about it because our vote don't count. And it didn't in the last election. You cannot convince me... 81 million people voted for that, that ticket. You can't convince me. Hey, I've been, I've been around politics all my life, and I've been around since JFK was president, okay? So all my life, I've been around politics. I won't tell you who my dad voted for in the late 60s. But anyway, George McGovern. <laughs> no, George Wallace. Worse. Racist. Big time. Made no bones about it. But I've been around politics all my life. And what I'm trying to say is, it's not about our vote not counting. It's about us standing up and saying, no. Thomas Massey in Kentucky sued this week with, I think, seven other politicians, the CDC and the airline industry, by the end of next week, you won't have to wear a mask on an airplane anymore. Matter of fact, the Senate voted yesterday overwhelmingly to do away with masks. Now, the House has got to do it, and then mashed potato brains got to, you know, okay it. But as soon as you threaten lawsuits, it all goes away. Just trying to help you. Why doesn't anybody wake up? Why do we think we got to take it? Why do we keep playing the games that they offer to us? Why do we act like sheep? You do know America was founded because people said, I'm not going to take it anymore. Enough's enough. Huh? Pull to Popeye. I've stands all I can stands and I'm not going to stands anymore. Well, people wouldn't wake up in Jeremiah's day. People aren't waking up in our day. Uh, I've had to go to Menards, Home Depot, and Lowe's 87 times in the last week. I'm amazed at how many people still wear masks. 
Now, I understand if somebody's sick, Miss, Miss Lynn just had a bacterial pneumonia. She was in the hospital. She was very sick. There was a point we thought we might lose her. I understand why she's wearing a mask. It's a health reason. But I'm, I'm looking at people by themselves in a car wearing a mask. You've got problems, friend. I'm trying to help you to see tonight. He was astonished when he started looking at people and saying, why don't you get it? I look at people and I'm astonished at how many smart people are so dumb. But he also said, I am black. Now we know Jeremiah was a Jew. He wasn't black. He's not talking about the color of his skin. What is he talking about? He is saying that he was so burdened and he had wept so much for them that he looked ghastly. He looked like a mourner uh, uh, who had done nothing but adorn themselves in black uh, and weep uh, 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 over the loss of something precious. Uh, he said, I'm black. Uh, he said, I've wept all I can weep. And I'm astonished that people don't wake up. We see the calamity, we see the cut, but in verse number 22, we see the cure. He says, is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no physician there? There was a balm in Gilead. There were physicians there. And more importantly, the great physician was God. He says, then why then is the health of the daughter of my people, uh, why then is not the health of my daughter, uh, the, uh, the daughter of my people recovered? There, and he says, is there not a balm in Gilead? You've got to understand, Gilead was just a little east of Jordan. And Gilead uh, had a special tree. It was called the Terabithinus tree. That tree was introduced to Israel as a gift from Queen Sheba when she came to meet Solomon. And that tree, uh, she introduced it, they planted it, it reproduced uh, uh, and it was a special tree because the resin or the gum that came from that tree had medicinal purposes. It had a, a nice fragrance, they tell me. But yet, that balm, that resin, they could use that uh, uh, in order to make a salve and make a, 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 a medicine to help folks. Kind of like an aloe vera plant. You know, you get a sunburn, you put a little aloe on, and you're ready to go out and get fried the next day. All right? But there's a lot of medicinal purposes to aloe vera. It's a good thing. Well, he says, is there no balm in Gilead? I got to thinking about that. I got to thinking about that balm. And I got to thinking about spiritual balm. With all that's going on in the world, and we got the Bible, and we got the truth, I understand why heathens act the way they do, but how come God's people don't live in victory and don't have joy and don't have the, the freshness of God in their soul. Is there no balm in Gilead? Is there no great physician anymore? And I got to thinking about spiritual balm. Proverbs chapter number 10, verse number 12 says, Hatred stirreth up stripes, but love covereth all sins. I got to thinking about a spiritual balm. I want to preach with God's help on the balm of love. I really believe if we would love right, we'd see a difference. We'd see a difference in, in our own personal lives, in our own personal communities. We could, we'd see a difference in the world. Matter of fact, there's been a big narrative the last couple of years trying to divide our country. Uh, it doesn't matter which side of the fence you're on, they're trying to drive a wedge between them. And we've seen everything from people of color to uh, uh, people of different backgrounds and different ethnicities and, and different uh, 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 wage earning classes. They're kind of just separate everybody and build all these splinters between people. But you know what happened with, when folks love right? There is no division. Our love of America should cause us to love fellow man. Mm -mm. Can I say, if we have the right spiritual balm, the balm of love, it'll change our church. It'll change our lives. And I got to thinking about the balm of love. Let me give you some and we'll go to the house. I got to thinking we ought to have a love for the Savior. 
Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse number 5 says and thou shalt love the Lord, the, the Lord thy God with all thine heart with all thy soul and with all thy might I wonder if we really love God that way huh? with all our heart with all our soul with all our might with everything of our being do we love God that much hmm? I mean we, we ought to Jesus thought so much of that verse in Deuteronomy he, he quoted it in all the gospels it's the greatest commandment he said that we should love God supremely. Mm. Uh, we love Him sometimes. But do we love Him enough to put this down? Do we love Him enough to put uh, this down? Do we love Him enough to put other things away that will spend more time focused on Him? Uh, we got to have a love for the Savior. Uh, uh, 1 Corinthians 8, 3 says, But if any man love God, the same is known of him. Let me ask you a question. Did those around you know you love God? Because the Bible says if you love God, uh, that will be known of you. Uh, I mean, everybody's going to know. Uh, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Uh, and if we do love him, and if we do keep his commandments, it will be known of you. Uh, 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 hey, uh, I wonder, do we really love him the way we should? Mm, we love him, but we love him selfishly a lot of times. We love him for what we can get from him. We ought to love him if we never get anything from him. Because of what he's already done for us. We ought to love the Savior. I got to think about this. We ought to love the saints. You know one thing I love about our church? Folks love one another. Folks enjoy being around one another. Uh, folks enjoy fellowship with one another. They hang out with one another. I mean, that's a blessing. Uh, a lot of churches, uh, folks rush in right before service starts. They leave right after the final amen. Uh, 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 they never see one another any other time. They never spend any time with uh, one another any other time. Uh, when they're in the house of God, uh, uh, they could care less about anybody else in there. Uh, I'm glad I don't go to that kind of church. Uh, let me say this. I wouldn't go to that kind of church. Uh, we ought to have a love for the saints. John said, uh, Jesus said in John 13, 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you have love one to another. Duh. You know what? When you love right, you love Jesus right, you love God's people right, people know that. Hmm? Matter of fact, you don't have to tell people you're a Christian. It'll just come out on you. Hmm? Paul wrote in Colossians 1, 4, Since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, the church of Colossia, and he said, and of the love which you have to all the saints. What a testimony. He hmm? said, you love God and you love the saints. You see, when your love's right and your love for the brethren's right, it's known everywhere. Hmm? Again, you don't have to tell people you're a Christian. It'll come out on you. Why? Because this world has a love problem. This world embraces hate and indifference. Hmm? Uh, the world's got a lust problem. They don't, they don't know anything about love. Uh, but can I say, when you love right, folks know it. Hmm? I don't wear a neon badge saying I'm a Christian. I don't wear a, a big old shirt saying Jesus freak. If my countenance and my attitude and my actions don't show people that I love God, it don't matter what I'm wearing. Hmm. Back when I worked in the secular world, most of you know I was in the furniture business. I was running a furniture store in Over the Rhine. Not a great place to have a furniture store, but we had a successful one there. I was there in the furniture store, and one day I'm sitting there, and uh, we, we'd got a truck in, a shipment in, and we had truck drivers running couches and tables and chairs and all kinds of stuff all over, and we had four stories, about 6,500 square feet, and just filling this thing up with all this furniture. And in the midst of that, two guys come through the back dock where our truck were. and they, I mean, they were dressed nice. It's nice. You could tell they were businessmen. They walked in and they said, uh, who's the preacher? I was the furniture man. I wasn't the preacher man on the job. I mean, I was a lay preacher in the church. But I mean, I didn't wear 
store manager slash preacher on me. Uh, so one of the men said, that's him right there. They come over, they start asking me, they were seeking to get businesses involved and doing a little community outreach down there, wanted to know if the business would give a, a donation to them. I said, well, I would, but it's not my money. I said, but here's, here's the owner's name, call him. I said, let me ask you a question. Who told you I was a preacher? He said, there's a little guy back here in the alley warming by a barrel. We was saying, hey, if we could get a reach, an outreach center down here, would you like to be a part of it? He said, yeah, it sounds something like something. He said, go in there and talk to that preacher. See, if you're right, even your enemies will know. I remember there was a man possessed. He said, Jesus we know. Paul we know. Who are you? Huh? How's your love tonight for the Savior? How's your love for the saints? You ought to appreciate and love the saints of God. You're only going to spend all of eternity with them. Huh? I thought about this. You ought to have a love for the shepherd. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, Verse 12, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be at peace among yourselves. Now, I know the preacher isn't much, but you ought to, you ought to love him. You ought to thank God for him. You ought to uh, esteem him highly for his work's sake. You ought to uh, uh, praise the Lord for him because there's a lot of folks out there who don't have a preacher tonight. A lot of churches don't have a shepherd. they got a hireling. Hmm? Uh, I, I just was telling Brother Ray today about uh, a church that just put in a preacher and uh, the only reason they put that preacher in is so they could control him they didn't want a shepherd you gotta love the shepherd he's the under shepherd there's the great shepherd Brother James just sang about, sang about the great shepherd but you ought to love the under shepherd you ought to love the savior you ought to love the saints you ought to love the shepherd you ought to love your spouse and your family you ought to they're a gift from God you ought to love them in Ephesians 5 the Bible says in verse 33 nevertheless let every one of you in particular so love his wife even you brother Ray even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband Miss Crystal that's for all the other women I just brought her out too and then chapter 6 of verse number 1, kids, listen to this. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. goes on to say that if you obey your parents and respect them, you'll live long. Some of you kids aren't going to live long. <laughs> nice knowing you. Uh, if they got to tell you three times to do something, you're not respecting your parents. Let me just help you. Back when I was your age, they didn't tell me three times. We didn't have one, two, three. Uh, you didn't do it the first time. You was liable to get something bounce up off the side of your head. Uh, you say, that's cruel. It got the job done. You know what's cruel? You not respecting your parents. I mean, they provide everything for you. They provide you food. They provide you clothes. They give you a nice bed to sleep in. You got Nintendos and Super Mario Brothers, and you got uh, 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 all kinds of games and all that. So so many games, you don't even go outside. Let me ask this question. I'm just going to ask this question. Kids, look at me. All of you look at me. If you're in here and you're a kid under the age of 18, and you know how to ride a bike, stand up. Colton, look at me. You get off that lazy carcass of yours and get off that couch and get out there and learn how to ride a bike. Now let me ask you kids that are standing, how often do you ride a bike? If you rode a bike in the last year, keep standing. That's pretty good. I think some of you are lying. All right, you can sit down. I want to tell you something. The greatest thing that happened in my day is when you got a bike. 
And that lasted you until you turned 16 and you got a car. Huh? Most kids don't know, don't know what a bike is. It's transportation. It's freedom. It's fun. And you can build a ramp and you can jump things. It's great. We did BMX before BMX was ever a thing, didn't we, Brother Clint? Huh? Kids don't know how to live. We didn't stay inside when I was a kid because we didn't have air conditioning. 90 degrees and then mama or grandma cooking inside is 150 degrees inside. I mean, I mean, you got up and you hit the road. You come home for dinner time. That was it. Wore that bike out. I don't forget when I was uh, 14, I put two sets of tires on my 10-speed over the summer. This one, we wore them out. Uh, how many kids know what a 10-speed is? That's what I thought. <laughs> All you bike riders, you lied, didn't you? Uh, a Schwinn 10-speed at that, huh? Uh, that was a high-dollar bike back in my day. Uh, Bikes aren't expensive anymore because kids want to do this all the time. Uh, parents, I'm going to help you with your kids. Turn their TVs off and get them on a bike. Uh, get them a rubber ball and a ball glove. Tell them to go find them a brick wall. That'll help them for a long time. Listen, you ought to love your family. Husbands, you ought to love your wives, even as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Wives, you ought to love your, your husband, especially if he comes to the house of God and he's faithful to God. There's a lot of women don't have that. They'd love to have that, a husband sit in church with them. You ought to be thankful. If you've got a husband that isn't saved or doesn't come to church with you, you love him. Your chance conversation might be what it is to win him. Your home's not to be a, a, a hellacious place. The home's to be a haven. You ought to love your husband. You ought to love your children. Children, you ought to love your parents. You ought to respect one another. Huh? If you don't respect your parents, kids, listen, you reap what you sow. Nobody's going to respect you. Hmm? Thought about this. I'm talking about the balm of love. We ought to love sinners. Jesus came seeking to save that which was lost. You know what Jesus did? He loved sinners. Had he not loved sinners, he'd never left heaven and came to the, uh, uh, the manger. Are you listening? He'd have never went to the cross and died for our sins, but he loved sinners. He loved us enough to die for us. And can I say he hates sin, but he loves a sinner. And we don't have to uh, agree with their sin or love their sin or identify with their sin, but we ought to love the sinner because Jesus does. And listen, I don't care who they are. That's somebody's daughter. That's somebody's son. That's somebody's brother. That's somebody's sister. That's somebody's mother. That's somebody's father. That's somebody that means somebody to somebody else. You ought to love them. You ought to try and win them to God. You ought to try and be a light to them. You ought to love sinners. Uh, listen, the same amount of blood it took to save you is what it takes to save them. Hmm? What can I say? You prove your love to sinners by walking upright before them. Don't ever lessen your standard around sinners. Mm. They ought to see how much you love Jesus. And they ought to see how much you love them by you not cowering to their standards. You live right. And I say this, you ought to love sinners by worshiping openly before them. I had somebody tell me this a long time ago. They told me this, and I put it into practice. It works pretty good. He said he learned a secret. He talks to sinners like he talks to saved people. Hmm? Yeah. They go, uh, say, how was your day? Bless God, it's good. God's been good to me. Has God been good to you? So the sinners just going, huh? Why do we treat them different? Just tell them how good God's been to you. Huh? Tell them how much God means to you. You say, oh, you're one of them ch church people. Yep, proud of it. Thanks for noticing. Huh? 
Nothing wrong with that. Nothing wrong with bowing your head in a restaurant and thanking God for your food. Hmm. Nothing wrong with letting sinners know who, who you love, and His name is Jesus. You show your love to sinners by witnessing to them, by giving them the gospel. Brother Brian, they may act like it's falling on deaf ears, but it means more to them than you'll know. They just got that harshness about them, that sinful part of them. They, they don't want you to see that it impacts them or affects them, but it does. And deep down inside, they appreciate that you care enough to tell them the gospel. They'll never tell you that until they get saved. When they get saved, they're going to come by and say, I want to thank you for all them times you came by and kept telling me about Jesus. Hmm? We ought to love sinners. Let me say this. We ought to love those that spar against us. We ought to love our enemies. Those who fight against us. Why? Because Jesus commanded it. Matthew 5, 44. But I say unto you, love your enemies. Bless them that curse you. Boy, it's hard to do. Somebody cusses you a blue streak and you've got to say, God bless you, I appreciate you. That's not easy, especially if you've got a little redneck in you. But you've got to be good to them. Goes on to say, do good to them to hate you. Boy, don't you hate that one. You've got a mean old neighbor. You want to clean up your dog's mess and throw it in their yard, and all of a sudden God tells you to go over and be good to them, mow their yard or something. Do good to them that hate you. Hmm? Listen to this one. And pray for them. Don't know what Phil said, but it's not that important. And pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you. You've got to love those that spar against you. What I found, I'll never forget, there was, I've told the story, but I'll just throw this out. There was, there was somebody just saying some awful lies about me. Yeah, I'm the pastor of Manuel Baptist Church talking about me like a dog. Well, on my best day, that's what I am, a Gentile dog, but, you know, it still doesn't sit well when you hear somebody telling you that you're that, but, but when they're lying about it. I'm just reading the Bible one day and come across that Matthew 5, 44, and the Holy Ghost said, okay, big boy, there you go. So what did you do? I started praying for him. I started praying God bless them. I started praying God be good to them. Say, what happened? God helped me when I was praying for them that was against me. And by the way, on down the road, that one that used to lie about me started being good to me. You can't beat the Bible. Just put it into practice. God gave it to us, to us for a reason. It works. Well, I got to thinking about this balm of love. Got to thinking about balm. I say, first of all, balm must be extracted. You got to obtain it. You can't sit on the side of the road and say, "Boy, I wish somebody dropped some balm on me." You've got to obtain it. You got to get it. Well, where do you get the balm of love? First John chapter four, verse seven, beloved. Let us love one another, for love is of God. And every one that loveth is born of God, and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. Where do you get love from, God? Because He is love. That qualifies that statement I made earlier, that the world doesn't know anything about love, it only knows about lust. They call it love, but it's not love. True love comes from God. And if you're going to love and have the balm of love and love properly, you've got to get it from God. Love must be extracted. This balm of love must be exercised. You've got to apply it, just like Matthew 5, 44. It's one thing to say, yeah, we need to love everybody. It's another thing to do it. You've got to put it, put it in application. You've got to just start doing it. Just start loving people in spite of them. Because I want to tell you something. God loved you in spite of you. And I thought about this. Love needs to be expressed. Bill Warnicke's picture is back there on the wall. 
He used to say, I told Eloise that I loved her when we got married. That was good enough. She's married 50 years. Told her one time. Some of you get that. But Tommy, you've got to catch up to that. That means you've done zero. Okay. I didn't know where you went to school. I didn't know your math ability right there, huh? <clears throat> love needs to be expressed. You say, well, they know I love them. Tell them anyway. More importantly, show them. Hmm? You know, I learned that marriages that have problems, the problem started out something small, but it was never addressed, and then it just festered and festered and festered and festered, and finally one day somebody doesn't leave the toothpaste cap on the toothpaste, and that's the last straw, and then they're over. Now, they didn't split up because of the toothpaste cap. They split up because they didn't address the problem. Why don't you show your spouse you love them? Brother Aaron, here, I'm going to help you right here. You need some help. Huh? Uh, she's got three kids between you and her. Now, I mean, there's a problem here, okay? Here's how you show you. Know, look, just come back from Mexico, and the honeymoon's already over. Look at her. Huh? Huh? Listen. When you go to brush your teeth tonight, I hope you do brush your teeth tonight, but when you go brush your teeth tonight, just put a little toothpaste on her toothbrush. So when she comes in, you've just shown her a kind gesture that you love her. You've already gave her some toothpaste on her toothbrush. You've done something out of the ordinary for her. Now, you've got to be careful because she's liable to grab it and then put her hand in it, and then she's going to be mad at you. So you've got you to gotta be kind of sly about that thing, you know. Just a little gesture sometimes to show your love is a whole lot better than having to make up for it when you've been in the doghouse. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, thank you, Brother Tommy. I've been there too. Huh? Listen, you've got to express your love. You've got to show your love. And then listen to me. This is very important. Love must be embraced. There is an underlying current in society today where people have been in abusive relationships, whether in a relationship as far as a courtship or relationship as in a, a parent and child relationship where the parent has nothing to say but mean, nasty things to their child and abusive all their life. Maybe it doesn't put their hands on them, Miss Marcy, but if somebody tells you you're no good, you're sorry, you're never going to amount to anything every day of your life for 15, 16, 17 years, you're going to believe that all your life. Hmm? If you're in a relationship, Brother Donald, where your spouse tells you you're sorry, you're no good, you'll never amount to anything, I'm the best you ever get, so you've got to put up with me, you'll believe that. And what happens, Miss Noreen, when you've been subject to that kind of stuff, when somebody genuinely tells you they love you, it's hard to accept because you don't think you're lovable. You don't think you can ever amount to anything because that's all you've ever been told. That's all you've ever been showed. Love must be embraced. The psych psychology of what I just said is real but what I'm about to say is just as real you are lovable God loves you he loved you so much he gave the best that he had when he gave his son to die for your sin you are lovable you do matter and if somebody genuinely tells you they love you, you can embrace it because you do matter. You matter to God. And you matter to more people than you think. So embrace the love of God and embrace the love from God's people and embrace love when somebody genuinely shows you love my dear friends 
I really believe if we would show and demonstrate more love, we would impact more people. Service started out with Brother Clint singing, How's your heart? Is your heart right with God? May I ask you tonight, How's your love? Because if your heart's not right, your love won't be right. But if your heart's right, you've got a good avenue for your love being right. How's your love tonight? You can't love anybody else till you love yourself. And you can't love yourself till you realize you are lovable and God loves you. How's your love tonight? How much love are you expressing to others? There is a world of folks hurting. And sometimes just a simple kind gesture will make all the difference. How much love are you expressing? You can't express it if you don't have it. When's the last time? You let love be without dissimulation and impact other people's lives because God through his love has impacted your life. Let's all stand tonight. Maybe the Lord spoke to your heart. The altar's open. Maybe you need to come do business with God. Maybe you want to come and thank him that he loves you and that he's been good to you. Maybe you need to come and say, Lord, show me somebody that I can express the love of God to. Maybe he spoke to you about another matter. Maybe you've never received God's love because you've never received His Son. Tonight would be a good night for you to come put your faith and trust in the Lord. A lot of folks are coming, seeking the Lord. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. While he's getting a song, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we sure do love you. First John chapter 4, verse 19 says, We love you because you first loved us. And God, we are so thankful for your great love. You demonstrated your love on Calvary when you bled and died for our sins. Lord, we're so thankful for the Word of God, the greatest love book ever written. We're thankful for the people of God. We can come. Lord, be transparent. Express our love one to another. God, we're so thankful for a good home, a good wife, a good children. Thank you, Lord, for being good to us. Now, Lord, bless this invitation. There are folks in the altar, you know the need, what they're crying out to. God, just bless each and every one of them. Lord, if there's somebody here that, Lord, just needs you to surround them with your love, I pray you do so during this invitation. God, do a work, and we'll thank you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Turn if you enjoyed today's broadcast, head on over to your app store and download the IBC Florence app today, where we have our music, sermons, videos, devotions, and much more. And as always, thanks for listening.